Good morning, all of you. I'm so pleased to see some familiar faces and also some new faces. So we want to continue this, you know, on a alternate year basis. Um, this is really more public education and also to bring in kind of uh, these discoveries in uh, science as, as well as uh, treatment and a chance also for you to network. And next year we will bring it to the NIH and I hope to see many of you there. And one thing which is very important, we need uh, your feedback because we need to know what you would like us to cover the big table. And I think there will be kind of a, a feedback sheets for it. So do help us improve this because at the yeah. end of the day, it is the audience uh, appreciation that matters a lot. Thank you very, very much, and I hope that you all will have a very good two days and remember the debates. Around the 
time that Philip Sherlock became vice chancellor. A little bit after that, another chap and his wife came and fell in love with Jamaica. Professor Sargent and Beryl Sargent. Is All right, but just around in the 60s, that work started with Professor Graham Sargent. And he also demonstrated his love affair for Jamaica. It stayed on, came from foreign, as we say, and stayed on, and continued to do research work. The essence of love, that love, you see it in the science. The people say, you know, if you have a, I don't know, the, the men in the audience, your wife ever asks you, honey, do you really love me? You say you love me, but show me you love me. You get that question? <laughs> the men are all silent. Huh? But you have to demonstrate your love, we know that, you know? There are all kinds of ways to show the language of love. And I think the language of love for a population is expressed in the results of the sickle cell work. I saw those statistics yesterday about the reduction in mortality from um, sickle cell, from lung disease, and the improvement in quality of life. That's a real expression of love. It's science and love. I don't, I don't see, yeah, you can applaud. Give them, give them a, an applause. It's, it's, And they, we have continued, in fact, now I'm very excited to hear that the sickle cell unit is involved in a trial on gene therapy. Um, so we continue to build out the science and I'm really excited that we can work with NIH and we can work with colleagues from across the world. I'm thankful for your visit, thankful for you choosing Jamaica. I want to encourage you to continue to build out that relationship. The university is very keen to establish and enlarge its global footprint. And so that we have a good relationship with NIH, but you might have come from Brazil or India or Australia or where else? Very far, Some, but you're here this morning. Iran. Iran? France, yeah. India, India, France, Africa, Africa. Africa. Guadalupe. 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 There you go, yeah. But wherever you're from this morning, okay. UK. <laughs> Wherever you're from this morning, we welcome you. I welcome you warmly. We look forward to building out our relationship further. We want to strengthen the love affair. And I hope that you will make this one of the homes for SCIF on an ongoing basis in the future. Thank you very much and all the best for the conference. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to add my welcome to that of the Dean on behalf of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research. We are tremendously happy to again partner with the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the staging of the conference. This 13th annual conference is, as you've heard, the second collaborative conference, and we hope it's a trend, um, jointly by the Sickle Cell Unit and NHLBI. And the first conference was held in 2017 and was a, clearly a tremendous success because we're here again. The conference provides important in-depth exposure for our consultants, trainee doctors, healthcare professionals and, and academics interested in hemoglobin disorders and allows them a window onto the current medical trends and research results in sickle cell globally. This year's conference will focus on updates in the status of sickle cell disease around the world. And as we've, we've had a roll call of where everybody has come from, a tremendous um, international people coming from as far as India, Tanzania, across the Caribbean. It's wonderful to have you all. There will also be, at the end of each day, a debate on topical is issues for which there is yet no definitive answer. And for us, a really important addition initiated by the Sickle Cell Unit is the patient panel, allowing conference participants to be exposed to patient priorities in care and research. And so we thank all of you who have come, all the speakers, for their contributions. Thank you to all the attendees, and as we've so, who've traveled, some who have traveled very far, some from Jamaica and the wider Caribbean. For our visitors, especially those, maybe that's your first time in Jamaica, I hope you will see something of our beautiful country. My congratulations to the team at the Sickle Cell Unit for their tremendous efforts in staging the conference. 
And for all of you, I hope that you'll truly enjoy Sickle Cell in Focus 2019. Thank you. So we're going to go straight into session one, which is sickle cell disease around the world. Both the United Nations and the World Health Organization have stated how much sickle cell disease is a global public health issue. And that's being showcased in this session as we have speakers from the United States of America, Guadeloupe, Africa, India, Europe, and Brazil. Quite a spread. And so we'll get right into it, and I'll invite Catherine Hassel from the University of Colorado, Denver, to start us off with the United States of America. Dr. Hassel. Good morning, everyone. It's always a daunting task, and I appreciate the uh, confidence of the organizers that I could, in 15 minutes, represent a vast country with what is otherwise a rare disease in a small population affected by sickle cell disease. I will do my best to keep us more or less on time. Thank you, sir. It advances as well? OK, very good. Uh, and let me just start with a premise. North America and the United States in particular as seen as a wealthy country, and we are. It is seen as a place where there is opportunity for cure for rare diseases like sickle cell, and there is and where there are all children are screened for sickle cell disease at birth, where there are providers expert, yes to my colleagues from North America, even in the adult world, who know about sickle cell disease. But what I would like to do today is to characterize for you what I perceive as the current challenge in the United States and the way that it's being addressed amongst many, many activities by many colleagues here and there, more qualified than me to talk about them. So in brief, sickle cell disease in the United States is characterized as a rare disorder. There are estimated to be 100,000 individuals living with sickle cell disease. More recent surveillance work in small pockets of the country suggests perhaps we're underestimating by 10 or 20%, but this still represents less than 0.003% of everyone who lives in North America. To be living with sickle cell disease is to be living with a rare disorder. And so it is a significant challenge for those living with it to find their way through a vast, complex, broken, I would argue, healthcare system with a rare disorder. In the US, the population is characterized by being predominantly of African descent, although the graphic in the top part of the slide you'll see is from the CDC emphasizing that as we have a growing Hispanic population in the United States, although the prevalence is lower, we have a growing number of individuals from that background represented in sickle cell disease. Most individuals affected with sickle cell disease are in the lower socioeconomic status and they live in urban areas. Most individuals who have health care coverage, and yes, 97% of them in the U.S. do, are insured by public programs. And we'll talk about that some tomorrow when I have the opportunity to discuss insurance and access to care in our session in public health. What we know is that those who join the public health system for insurance are often sicker. They can't obtain the employment necessary to get private insurance. They tend to utilize the health care system more, although interestingly, and perhaps uniquely in North American phenomenon, there's a significant amount of opiate usage, and it is not a difference between those commercially and publicly insured. Those who are publicly insured bear the burden of chronic disease more so than those who have private insurance, again, perhaps because those privately insured are well enough to be employed to obtain that form of health care coverage. But both groups bear a significant burden of chronic disease, especially into adulthood. We know that uh, we're well aware of hydroxyurea, as are many places around the world. There are providers willing and ready to prescribe it, but connecting patients to those providers and sustaining adherence to those therapies is complicated. And as you can see on this table, only 21% of individuals, based on administrative data for all those vagaries, are actually using hydroxyurea. Now, this is all comers. Perhaps only half should be considering hydrea. Perhaps those on transfusion should not be receiving it. But I think the bottom line on the table is as telling as anything. In this particular administrative data set, only 7% of individuals, adult or pediatric, had actually seen a specialist. Most are seeking care in this administrative data set with primary care providers who have capacity if they just have knowledge. Mortality is often discussed, of course, in the realm of sickle cell disease, as I discussed last year at this conference. There is no change in the median age of death, at least in North America, as compared to 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. 
Now with surveillance and more careful assessment of the population, we are learning that in fact there is a cohort of individuals indicated by the arrows that are surviving later into adulthood. We just never knew them because they weren't intersecting with the healthcare system. So as we learn more, I think we will learn better about the population in the United States. And this is just another depiction of the curve to show that maybe we're losing a little bit slowly that earlier mortality in young adulthood and shifting it into the older age groups where ultimately we all eventually die. We just hope to sustain life for as long as possible. Oh dear. Okay. I don't know if I can click anything. I think my colleague there needs to click okay. Thank you, sir. All right. One of the major issues that has been impacting sickle cell care in many uh, aspects of care and many diseases is what is called the opiate crisis. It was recognized in the last decade that more and more individuals were taking more and more opiates, perhaps in disease states where that's not appropriate. The CDC came out with guidelines in 2016 that said unless you are dying of cancer or receiving active cancer pain that maybe opiates are not for you. This was interpreted and they set a limit of how much opiate they thought a human ought to have if they were going to get them at all. This was interpreted in my country as a call to take away opiates from all individuals, including those with sickle cell disease, with the accepted groups. Work subsequently followed by my a very expert colleagues to show that there is no increase in opiate use in the population of sickle cell patients in North America, in the United States, and that you are actually four to five times less likely to die of an opiate-related complication with sickle cell disease than you are if you're taking opiates for migraine headache or for fibromyalgia. This awareness and advocacy uh, about uh, sickle cell disease and its very painful nature, especially in adulthood, led to the CDC to say, oops, we made a mistake. And this year they issued an erratum that said, we've been doing it wrong when applying these opiate guidelines to individuals with sickle cell disease, which they equate to cancer pain. And the public insurance program subsequently came on board to say, indeed, sickle cell disease should not be included in those restrictive guidelines and counting pills, but rather thoughtful application of opiates is in fact appropriate for individuals living with sickle cell disease. But this is the milieu in which individuals with sickle cell disease have existed in North America. So in general, they come from minority com communities, they have a low socioeconomic status, they are publicly insured with a high burden of chronic disease and often pain in adulthood. I would characterize the use of disease-modifying therapies as uncertain. I would say in my institution they do wonderfully, but there are clearly areas where that is not the case. There remains a shortened life expectancy, and they face a large, complex healthcare system where in vast areas of my country they've never heard of sickle cell or thought that was cured long ago. So this, in fact, is the challenge. In the North America, there are 30 million pediatric visits to the emergency room of all, of all children. Only 44,000, or less than 0.001% are for sickle cell disease. And in fact, pediatric uh, emergency room visits, blood disorders of any kind don't rise to the top. So if you happen to be traveling or landing in a part of, uh, of the United States that is not particularly urban, there's no academic medical centers, and walk in, I have to say, I have sickle cell disease, they'll say, what's that? They've never seen it. It is a rare disease, a vast system with millions of children seeking care, none of whom, as for the most part, have sickle cell disease. For hospitalizations, there are 35 million people or hospitalizations in North America, of which only 100,000 are, are for sickle cell disease, 0.003%. So a little bit, is it fair to walk into a state and say, hey, I have sickle cell disease, treat me rightly, when they've never seen sickle cell disease, not even once, because it's not a part of the country where it's common. And in fact, there are only 85 hospitals out of thousands in the United States that have more than two or 300 admissions per year. Now that's a pretty high bar, but it's only 1,000 that have had more than 10 admissions for sickle cell disease. So even though we have guidelines, even though we have technology, even though we have providers, we have to get them connected to individuals and or enable the vast system to be able to manage. This is the distribution now old, but probably accurate for relative purposes of where the distribution of individuals living with sickle cell disease are in the United States. You can see that light color, ah, that is a huge expanse. Now to be fair, there's more sheep than people in that part of my country. <laughs> but nonetheless, some may choose to live there, some may choose to recreate there, some may choose to go to school there and raise their family there. We need to address that. Even within states with high prevalence, you can see the darker the color, the more individuals living with sickle cell disease. And in these two states, Georgia and California, with lots of individuals, depends upon which county you're in as to whether or not they've even seen an individual in the healthcare system with sickle cell disease. 
And this just is a very old slide, but to show thus the providers with knowledge are clustering in the areas where individuals are living with sickle cell disease. At least that match is an important one. So the US challenge I would see in the modern era is connecting a small, very sick population who deserves the best care which we, for which we have guidelines with providers in the place where they are. And even in those places like, well, I live in California, I live in Georgia, it depends on which county you're in. And as I'll show you tomorrow, it depends upon what part of the city you're in as to whether or not that healthcare provider even realizes that sickle cell disease is still a problem in North America. And so all the guidelines, all the cures that we have will not suffice if we can't connect providers uh, and patients who need them. So I'm going to briefly, in the time remaining, review what I view as an important, some coalescence of effort in North America, which is to make this connection between the healthcare system or providers and the individuals living with the disease in these various arenas. So the CDC is our surveillance organization in North America, in, in the US. It is uh, the way, they have the skills and a long, long, decades long history of finding folks, and only last year, only last year were they permitted to officially look at sickle cell disease, but they were. And they were doing it before anyway, just don't tell the Congress people. And so they're expanding their efforts to do surveillance programs in seven and additional states as, long, as well as California and Georgia to begin to develop our capacity to see where people are, to see what their health care needs and to see what their outcomes are. HRSA is the organization that helps us develop the health care system and programs, not really research but development of health care. And they have now a, a treatment demonstration program that has been going on for some time with an emphasis in this year to enhance this connection between knowledgeable providers and those living with sickle cell disease, emphasizing collaboration with those primary care visits that I didn't even realize patients, in fact, were making, and providing telementoring, Project ECHO calls, they're called in, in the United States, and then calling for each state, whether or not you have two people or 200,000 people, to characterize a plan for your state, of which 43 states have done. Now, will anything come of those? I don't know. It's a nice piece of paper, but at least it's a starting point. And then they have what it's called the newborn screening program, but actually empowers communities to use community health workers to uh, find individuals with sickle cell disease. And this is just a depiction of the regions. And I've been, I, I belong to the region, the light green, which is a geographical half of the United States. And somehow, we're going to connect everybody together and find folks. A daunting task, but one that we adopt enthusiastically. The NIH continues to support research. They have to have the CURE uh, sickle cell initiative to accelerate gene therapy. Again, wonderful. We'll just need to find the folks who need it. And stem cell transplantation, another curative therapy. They also have, though, recognizing that if you have the CURE, you've got to get it to the people, the implementation consortium. Now in its third year, this seeks to uh, fill in these gaps and connections that are not presently uh, available within the healthcare system. They have a registry. Comment about that in a bit. And they have a focus in emergency department care and using apps to make sure you take your pills once you have access to them and finding those patients who are out there that we don't know about that might benefit from care in the knowledgeable system. There's a lot of research ongoing. Many of you know in your own countries and areas about those. And there are other national efforts, including uh, from the PCORI Institute, Patient Centered Outcomes, which recognizes that dicey time in life for anybody, even without a disease, going from being a child to an adult but the transfer from pediatric to adult care, and have spent $18 million in two places to understand how to better facilitate that uh, for individuals making that journey. And Doris Duke Foundation continues to fund uh, mostly basic science work. Sorry, I got there. The biggest change I would say or newly activated emphasis has been by the American Society of Hematology, where they have an initiative to, on a global level, let me say, reduce the burden of sickle cell disease. And they have a research collaborative whereby they're in the process of formulating a research uh, clinical trials network, which will have a centralized data hub, another registry, uh, and this, uh, these, uh, this network of sites ready to do research and interventional trials would be funded by uh, those who would come to use the network. But an effort, again, previously there was a federal one, to coalesce the work in the, across the country and harness the multiple sites that are qualified to conduct this work. We, of course, still have the SCDAA, the Sickle Cell Disease uh, of America. They are the recipient of that HRSA money that does the Community Health Worker Program. They are meeting as we speak in Baltimore um, and uh, have a lot of national activity at the community-based level. But still, I would say, in, North, in the United States, we have this issue of a lot of people working very hard, very well-funded in many cases, 
And it, at the end of the day, the individual wakes up and notices the penicillin bottle is empty or the hydroxyurea bottle is empty. And how, who do I call and where do I go? And by the way, who's tracking what I did so that we know that it works? So it's still a complicated system. So I am happy to report since I last spoke with you that there's an increase in effort of coordination. So the American Society of Hematology has a coalition that characterizes this more as a multifaceted group of individuals who are at least communicating about that the work they're doing on many different levels from the community to basic science research. The Health and Human Services is a federal group, group by acknowledgement that they have lots of agencies going in a lot of different directions and an effort to coordinate efforts. And then finally, there is the National Academy of Sciences uh, commissioned by our Office of Minority Health to, uh, in the next 18 months, uh, I guess 12 months are left of that, to create a strategic plan and blueprint for action across the United States. A laudable goal, daunting at best to characterize the landscape of sickle cell disease in the United States, but at least it represents an effort to see what we are doing and to see if we can coordinate. When I spoke about this uh, in 2016, I characterized the uh, uh, image on the, on the, to the left showing lots of different arrows going lots of different directions. I would submit in the modern day there are still lots of different arrows, but they're starting to point in some coalesced direction with the recognition that with all this activity, if we can't find the individual, we can't find the family, they can't figure out how to connect with us, that this is the key for all of these efforts to pay out. And I would say in conclusion that it, it's a common perspective, not just mine, I think, that we know in, our, in the United States there's pockets of expertise, willing even adult providers to take care of those living with sickle cell disease. But not everyone may choose to live in an urban area. It's a vast country with lots of hubs, lots of potential spokes. And what I think the United States needs to continue to focus on is collecting and organizing all of these efforts in a way that a single individual can land in any state, in any emergency room, in any hospital, and at least the providers there, even if they've never seen it, knows what sickle cell disease is, and knows how to manage through shared resources and supportively from the experts that are available. And with that, I will stop, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine, for a great start to the session. You know, those of us who live in the um, third world, the developing world, we always think, boy, everything is perfect in America, right? <laughs> so it's nice to know that, um, yeah, it's not quite there yet, but they also are heading in the right direction. So thank you much for that. Um, it's my pleasure now to ask um, my friend and colleague, Mary Dominique hardy de Source from Guadeloupe, who is the, um, the leader of the Caribbean Network for Sickle Cell Disease and Thalassemia um, Research, um, to come and speak to us about the Caribbean. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. I thank the organizer, the organizer to, for inviting me to speak about sickle cell disease in the Caribbean. This Caribbean region whose borders are not unanimously defined can at the first instance uh, could be considered at a group of essentially island territories bordered by the Caribbean Sea and uh, organized in 13 independent states, including Jamaica, and 17 overseas territories, including the French territories, as Martinique and Guadeloupe, where I come from. 43 millions of inhabitants with five official spoken languages. But a wider definition of the Caribbean based on geopolitical criteria will also include the Caribbean facade of Central America. Oh, excuse me. The Caribbean facade of Central America the coastal plains of Colombia, Venezuela, and the Guianas. But Caribbean is above all a region, a, mar a space marked, marked by its historical heritage of sugar plane plantation, 
who has had a significant impact on its population. A large proportion of these populations traces its ancestry from Africa uh, as a consequence of the Atlantic slavery. So from the 16th century to the 19th century, millions of African enslaved Africans have been deported from the west coast of Africa to the America and uh, the Caribbean. And a second wave of migrations is that of Indian indentured laborers coming from India, majority from India, to address the demand of sugar plane plantation labor after the abolition of the slavery. It's, it is how the sickle cell gene entered the Caribbean population and estimated data suggests a high prevalence of sickle cell disease in the Caribbean region, but still now epidemi epidemiological data on the prevalence and the burden of the, dis of the disease is still incomplete. The most reliable epidemiological data come from newborn screening program implemented in uh, Jamaica and in the French territories. In Jamaica, where uh, strong and well-established programs are implemented for a long time, the coverage were around 50% uh, and uh, the screening became island-wide on, 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 until uh, 2015. In the French territories, universal program screening were initiated for around 30 years ago in Guadeloupe and Martinique and 20 years ago in French Guiana. All these uh, islands have uh, comprehensive sickle cell care facilities. And in uh, Cuba, where there is uh, an, an integrated public health program, the screening is a prenatal testing mandated by law in 1983. So uh, uh, beyond this first set of islands where uh, universal screening is implemented, uh, as indicated in this slide, by the red signals in Cuba, as I previously said, Jamaica, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and French Guiana, universal screening programs are also more recently implemented in Costa Rica. Ah. In Costa Rica, in uh, Tobago, in... Um, San Lucia for a long time, but, but with weak technical means, uh, since they use, they still use uh, acetate electrophoresis, but also in the territories of US, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands, mandated by law. Uh, elsewhere, there are uh, pilot studies have been, have been implemented in Venezuela, Haiti, Grenada, San Vincent, Guyana, but these pilot programs are uh, often stopped, stopped when the program are ended because of lack of funding and government support. This slide. This slide summer is a summer summary of the data of this uh, screening, a, either universal or pilot screening, and shows that the prevalence of sickle cell disease are different around the Caribbean, with the highest prevalence found in Grenada and 80, one out 150, one out 170, and in Jamaica, one out 188. 
there is a, the lower prevalence are found in Cuba and in Costa Rica reaching one out 14,000. A major challenge is uh, the implementation of sustainable screening and CARES, which is the Caribbean uh, Sickle Cell Disease Network, has uh, recommended the following uh, uh, recommendations for the lesser entities, uh, given the small size of the population and the high cost of the equipment, CARES recommended central, uh, lab centralization of the screening through reference laboratories present in the Caribbean, in Jamaica and Guadeloupe, uh, capable of performing HPLC and isoelectrofocusing analysis. Unfortunately, this centralized uh, screening this, uh, has not been always successful, and we are now uh, uh, developing another program funded by European funding to evaluate the evolution toward using point-of-care testing evaluation. This program has been initiated in Grenada and should be uh, conducted in Antigua and Dominica. For the Greater Antilles, Haiti and Dominican Republic that represent uh, around 50% uh, of the Caribbean population, CARES advocates for a local development of the screening and uh, supports the, the training of technicians for implementation of the gold standard methods. Uh, but the, an alternative strategy could be also the implementation of the point of care testing with the sickle, scan, the sickle scan devices and hemotype device, devices, with, which has been already positively evaluated in Haiti and in Martinique in the framework of a collaborative study conducted with American and African teams. Once the children are uh, identified Early life intervention I implemented with no much difficulties in, the, in these uh, different regions under the management of the sickle cell centers where they are present or the pediatric of hematology hospital departments according to the clinical, clinical care guidelines and the usual measure, penicillin prophylaxis, pneumococcal vaccination, parents' education, supported by active sickle cell association, uh, who, which always so often uh, have intervention to uh, overcome the difficulties of the healthcare organization. And they are supported by other uh, stakeholders uh, or regionally present, such as COSCA, which has been a foundation of sickle cell association uh, very active for many years, um, a, a powerful advocacy group, and now the relay, the relay is taken by CARES and other associations such as Sick, Sick Kids Caribbean Initiative and also the or Cincinnati Hospital, the Cincinnati Children Hospital. Another preventive uh, survey, such as screening, transcranial Doppler screen examination, is uh, not uh, so usually uh, uh, implemented in the Caribbean. And uh, as indicated in this slide, it is present in Cuba, Jamaica, and the French Department of America but also in Dominican Republic and Costa Rica. In Jamaica and the Dominican Republic, alongside the screening, a routine screening, it is also a research screening conducted in the framework of a partnership with Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And as seen is this, 
slides, uh, prevalence of conditional TCD ranges between 5.6% in Cuba to 23% in Dominican Republic, while uh, abnormal TCD uh, prevalence are closer, ranging from 3.6% to 6.5%. In Cuba and Jamaica, conditional and abnormal TCD are treated by hydroxyurea, and while in the French territories and Dominican Republic, the abnormal TCD uh, receive monthly, trans monthly transfusion. Uh, this abnormal TCD is for always uh, an up, uh, there is also an up, it is also, also a condition for bone marrow transplant for the, in the French Department of America. Uh, as you can see, these modifying therapies, hydroxyurea and uh, transfusion, are not uniformly, uniformly used in the Caribbean. And uh, it appears that hydroxyurea is the most widely used uh, therapy in this region, even if clinicians face with packaging and cost problems. Why transfusion due to security concerns and the lack of availability of red cell pockets, uh, there is a limited use of transfusion, which in some cases is considered as an impracticable option. It's uh, as reported by our colleagues in Jamaica. Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, remains an expensive uh, uh, condition with uh, and the requirement of compatible sibling donors and specialized transplantation uh, centers are major obstacles limiting its, its accessibility, uh, which is for the moment uh, accessible only for the French territories, but uh, overseas. Some words about uh, the contribution of the Caribbean to research. We all uh, know the, the useful information uh, provided by the Jamaican cohort. Nowadays, with the presence of comprehensive sickle cell centers, uh, we have access to well-characterized uh, cohorts, which has useful tools, tools and uh, the the, the works conducted by the scientists from Jamaica, Guadeloupe, and Cuba could be continued uh, to, uh, to investigate uh, sickle cell disease severity markers. And still now, there is uh, effort, there is a lack of, of effort, affordable approach for treatment and diagnosis. And uh, CARES is uh, committed in uh, participating to these efforts to, uh, uh, to improve these, uh, these, these tools for new treatments and diagnoses. And uh, on behalf of our, my, uh, Karis, my, my Karis colleagues, I would like to thank uh, those uh, Sickle Cell in Focus teams for uh, bringing us together around uh, exchange that promised to be fruitful. I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mary Dominique. Um, it's already clear the difference is our own, right? Um, and we're moving from a region with many little islands to a continent with huge countries, and it's no easy. I'm inviting Julie McEnany to come and tell us about sickle cell disease in Africa. Thank you very much, um, 
Swile and John for inviting Jennifer and um, the team here in um, Jamaica. Um, very similar to the first speaker on um, the US, it's very difficult to say that we're going to provide in 15 minutes a summary of what's happening in Africa, which has a population of a billion people. But I'll try. So, how do I move this forward? So, um, I'll, I'll just skip over this because a lot of us know um, about the genetic um, defect and the consequences that it has. And the interesting thing is that it causes a wide range of um, disease, some with very mild forms of the disease and some with very severe forms of the disease, which um, is associated with a high risk of mortality. So um, Fred Peel and colleagues estimated that between 2010 and 2050, 14 million children will be born with sickle cell anemia in the world. This is 14 million. The majority of them will be in Africa. It's estimated that 84% of these 14 million will be born in Africa. And the tragedy is, if you're born in Africa with sickle cell disease, the chances are you will not be identified to have the disease. And if that is the case, then um, you have a 90% chance of not surviving to the age of five. Whereas if you're born in Jamaica, if you're born in the UK, in the US, childhood mortality is close to um, at least 80%. So we in Tanzania, we in Africa thought that this is something that we needed to do something about. How can we work, learn from the experience from other places so that we can improve childhood mortality in our countries? And um, the experience from the US is really um, important in demonstrating that just by identifying children as early as possible, providing them with comprehensive care, preventing infections, providing prompt diagnosis and treatment, you can have a 70% reduction in childhood mortality in the zero to three year, year age group. And so our focus in terms of primary care or in terms of um, universal access is really to try and see how we can get our governments to strengthen and to um, improve the system so that we can introduce early diagnosis and provide comprehensive care to children so that we can achieve the 70% um, survival. And this is the reason why we continue working, because one of the things that we get asked very frequently in places where there's a lot of TB, HIV, malaria, is why are you working in sickle cell disease? This is a condition that's genetic, this is a condition that has a, um, very few people know about it, and you're not going to make much of a difference. The reality is that we do have a lot of children, a lot of individuals who require treatment, and so it's our responsibility to try and see what we can do within the limited resources that we have. So over the past 20 years, within Africa, there's just been a lot of work that has been going on to try and improve and implement the interventions that we know work. Four things have limited the progress that have been achieved. And the four is that we have all been working individually within our own centers, within our own countries, and have missed the um, learning that we can get from shared experiences as part of a consortium. We have also had difficulty in deploying consistent standards of care. And then very few individuals working in the health sector know what is the appropriate um, diagnosis and treatment for individuals with sickle cell disease. So we needed to address the skills and the number of people who know how to manage sickle cell disease. And then as part of um, academic and research activities, there have been very few um, research um, programs that have been trying to look at sickle cell disease in Africa, and to guide locally appropriate interventions. So we set up um, Sickle in Africa, which is a consortium that consists of three different initiatives. And the aim is really to reduce the burden of sickle cell disease in Africa, whilst establishing capacity for research so that we can identify ways that we can improve healthcare as well as um, contribute to find um, research, contribute to the research to find a cure. So, as um, I've mentioned before, the limitation is that there have been lots of progress, but each country, each institution has been working um, alone, not in collaboration, and the standards of care needs to be addressed appropriately, depending on the level of health care, and then address the skills. So, this is in-service in, in training, pre-service training, 
as well as finding ways that we can focus um, the training to different individuals at different times as appropriate, and then see what we can do in terms of uh, improving the research that we're conducting and learning from the expertise and experience um, around the world. So the Sickle in Africa um, um, program consists of three initiatives. The Sickle Pan-African Research Consortium, which consists of three countries, Tanzania, Nigeria, and Ghana. Um, initially, when we were writing this um, grant application to the NIH, we had included um, Cameroon and um, DRC. But because none of us had had experience with working with um, multi-site um, consortium, we were advised that we should focus on three countries, and these are the countries that we're working in. Then the Sickle Africa Data Coordinating Center is led by Ambrose and Nikki Morgan from the um, University of Cape Town in South Africa. And the plan is to extend these two initiatives and to support the establishment of, of the Sickle Pan-African Network. And when we're developing this, we had um, um, commitment and interest from 22 sites in 17 countries. The program is funded from 2017 and 2021, and very similar to the um, experience in the, uh, from the Caribbean network as well as from the US, is that we have to find a way of making this sustainable and not just be dependent on cycles of funding. So the aims are really four, just to summarize them. The first aim is to set up a registry, and the aim is to, to enroll 13,000 individuals with sickle cell disease amongst the three countries. The second aim is to develop um, recommendations, and we avoided using the words guidelines uh, just because of the um, procedures in establishing guidelines, so recommendations for standards of care, and this is led by um, Kof, who most of you know, Kwako Hena from, from Pong, who leads this working group. The first working group is led by um, Rafael Sangeda, working with the SADAC team. The third aim is to really, um, led by Obi from um, Nigeria, it's really to look and see what are the skills and training um, that are required within the setting? Identify the training that is already ongoing, see how these can be developed further to strengthen um, the capacity that we have. And then the fourth aim is to develop plans. So not really to conduct research, but to develop research concepts, not to develop research um, activities, uh, research um, proposals that would then be um, carried out after we've set up the consortium. So we've had um, progress in, in year three of the, of the four-year cycle, and we've been able to establish um, the, the systems for working and the, and the, and the um, procedures for working together. We've been having um, regular consortium meeting, and um, we've been able to develop the database, which is um, using REDCap as, as, as the, back, as the um, basis, and um, set up um, or written the first draft of the standards of care guidelines which have already been sent for review. In terms of skills development, we're developing appropriate um, training, initially data as well as clinical and um, management of sickle cell disease, and then planning the research um, activities. So in terms of enrollment, um, we've been able to enroll, um, this was in April of this year, and currently we've enrolled 8,000 out of the um, um, 13,000 patients that we aim to enroll, and 70% um, are uh, uh, um, children and 30% are, are, are adults. There have been a few differences with regards to Kumasi in Ghana, they see a lot more pediatrics, um, whereas in Nigeria it's um, a mix, but they, and Tanzania is a mix, but the spread is, is very similar, 70% adults, 70% uh, children and 30% um, adults. We have a whole range of partners um, from um, at, at institutional level, at um, network level, at regional level, and the aim is really to make sure that we try and learn from each other so that we don't duplicate or replicate um, mistakes and we learn from the experience of others. So the question that um, we've been asking ourselves over the past two, two um, maybe 18, 18 months is really how can we um, how can Africa participate in finding a cure for sickle cell disease when we haven't even started addressing just comprehensive care? And this was precipitated by the work that um, Jean Antoine and, and Marina Cavazzana carried out in successfully conducting gene therapy in, in the patient in France. And we felt that as part of H3 Africa and part of the efforts that we're doing, what were the things that we could learn and we can do from um, our setting? And the background for this for, for others is that um, there's been a lot of interest over the past seven years 
to strengthen genomic research in Africa. And this is part of the Human Hereditary and Health um, Initiative, H3Africa, which was set up in response to um, um, concerns that Africa and other low and middle income um, countries wouldn't be left out of the genomic revolution and how could they contribute to understanding um, how genes and the environment influence disease. And so seven years ago, um, the first um, round of, of um, grants were awarded and then um, more recently, um, the second round, which is, which is in year two of the second round, has been awarded with work from um, Solomon of Oriakwa leading, looking to understand the genetics of hemolysis in sickle cell disease. Now, all of this is accompanied by really looking at the clinical phenotype and laboratory phenotype, strengthening the bioinformatics capacity, training, looking at all the ethical and social issues of conducting genomic research as well as research in places where there's limited resources. So the question with regards to both um, um, gene therapy and bone marrow transplant is where realistically would we conduct such research? Where realistically would we be um, um, providing transplant? And these are examples of some of the facilities that have been identified in Tanzania, similarly in the other countries. And we've been working with colleagues um, from within Africa and, and the US and Europe to train and identify what are the critical research areas that we need to address um, when it comes to this. We've developed, developed partnerships, and as you all mentioned, academic partnerships with um, um, academic and research institutions, health partnerships, and this is important because this is the um, Assistant Secretary of Health who's been working with the um, WHO Afro to kind of identify and raise awareness about sickle cell disease in the Afro, the African region and then advocacy with patients, making sure that whatever it is that we're doing, we're doing with their understandings, not as, as, as participants, but as partners. So in summary, our strategy in Africa, not dissimilar to a lot of what all of us in this room have been doing, is really trying to strengthen research to improve health advocacy and training within our small institutions as well as within the network. And what we are keen to do is to make sure that the efforts in implementing improvement in care complement and go hand in hand with efforts to um, conduct research to find a cure. What, what, we find, what we find very uncomfortable is this perception that it's impossible to do both. And we'd like to say that the priority really is improving comprehensive care so that the majority of patients receive um, the care that is needed, but also find a way that we can work together to um, um, contribute to finding a cure and that's why it's, we find that it's very important to partner to learn and understand that in order for us to find a solution we can learn from each other whether it's in the US, in the Caribbean, in Europe and we can work together to find a cure for sickle cell disease but in the meantime find a way that we can improve the, patient, the life of the patients who are living with sickle cell disease currently and thank you for your attention Thank you so much, Drewy. And I now invite Dr. Dipti Jain to come and share with us about um, her work in India. She's done a, a fantastic um, job there. And many people actually don't understand how important sickle cell disease is in India. So we're very happy and pleased to have her here. A very long trip. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Good morning, namaste. I'm pleased to be here. I thank the organizers for inviting me here. Um, actually, India is an epitome of heterogeneity uh, with respect to culture, language, and ethnicity. And I can extrapolate this to the sickle cell disease in India with respect to the distribution, severity, clinical presentation, and access to care. Um, this is a picture of my institute from where I come and I'll be precisely talking in the next 15 minutes about the heterogeneity and the comprehensive care model we have in India. I think we've been looking at this again and again and we know the burden is uh, around uh, the estimate from existing data says it's about 5 to 10 million 
sickle cell patients are in India. And the estimate also says that it will be the third largest country which will have maximum newborns born with sickle cell disease. Now the gene frequency rate in India varies from 1 to 40 percent from different regions in India. I come from central India which is the pocket, should say the capital of sickle cell disease. And there are not many um, studies on genomic modulators of sickle cell disease in India. And whatever literature exists says that 90% of them have Indian haplotype, as we know, has high hemoglobin F, varying from 8 to 28%. Uh, deletional alpha thalassemia is associated in 24 to 97% as we go from west to east of India. And the thing is, the disease is not heterogeneous all over. It's the severest in central India. It is mild in West and South India. East would be somewhat in between. So this is the peculiarity and then it goes, keeps on telling that India sickle cell disease is mild, which I don't think so. The Central India has the maximum number of patients and are very severe. Now these are the clinical manifestations you all know. I don't need to say about this. I just want to say the triad again is pain as it is globally, infection, the profile of infection is different, which includes malaria, dengue fever, very, very severe. The outcome if the sickle patient has malaria and dengue is very different from non-sickle patients. The bacterial profile of infections is different. I have no time to discuss here, but it's different in spite of giving penicillin prophylaxis and vaccination. The anemia, most of them, I would say, have not seen a child who is not severely anemic of sickle cell disease. And apart from a plastic crisis, sequestration crisis, it's, I think majority of them have nutritional anemia, and including iron deficiency anemia, which we say may not be common in sickle cell disease, but it is in our part of the world. Uh, other some peculiarities which we have is, like, um, in our clinic, we have around two patients of leg ulcer in last 35 years. While if we move north of Nagpur, it would be like 5 to 10 percent of them will have uh, leg ulcers. The other peculiarity in our part is the seasonal variation, which is not extreme cold and extreme hot. It is mainly the monsoon where the morbidity is maximum and the depth is maximum and persistence of splenomegaly in second and third decade. Um, newborn screening in India, yes, it is feasible up to the periphery level, even in the uh, villages in the tribal area, the health workers, they collect the sample on a filter paper for NVS. And early 2000, we had four states starting the newborn screening program. But the challenge was in the follow-up. The children with sickle cell disease were not followed up. That was the problem and that's the purpose of doing NBS. However, at our center, we have an NBS diagnosed sickle cell patients who are followed up. And I think today the eldest, uh, oldest patient would be around 18 years. But this is a picture which uh, I would like to show that I was surprised the severity of the morbidity. Um, we, we, when we started, we didn't have much of uh, programs to enter the data. So we have a simple timeline. As you can see, this is done when all patients, we have a simple timeline which is color coded pain, green, infection, stroke. So you can see these are the few patients who were admitted. Most of them before a year had so many morbid events, including stroke. One patient, I, I was surprised to see repeated recurrent stroke in a child less than three years repeatedly. Of course, now we have TCD, but then uh, osteomyelitis, infections, and pain were the main uh, presenting features here. Um, this would be 
uh, like um, hydroxyurea and uh, the effect on uh, acute events. This is a very busy slide. I have tried to summarize the uh, publications from India, from different parts of our country. And hydroxyurea definitely has reduced the morbidity in terms of pain, blood transfusion, and hospitalization. Definitely, there is no doubt about it. The, the purpose, the rationale of giving low fixed dose hydroxyurea in India was that first the capsules, when we started in 2000, they were expensive, they were costly, and second, we had the fear of monitoring. The patient won't be monitored probably. And one thing we in India believe that for us, clinical outcome is more important than the hematological outcome. And so we all uh, have looked at the clinical outcome as a primary objective and the hematological outcome were the secondary objective. And it is useful, definitely. However, the problem is with the barriers of hydroxyurea, as we say everywhere else, it has been made accessible now. I think with Government of India getting involved, it is available, but it is the problem of acceptability with the patients and even with the physicians. We need to do much more on this to make it more acceptable and work with the misconceptions they have. Now, this is a model of integrated healthcare system in India. It is a well-oiled disease investigated and, uh, I should say, a referral network from grassroots to the uh, tertiary care scaling up there. And it's who does what at which level is very clear in India. And for states who have high prevalence in sickle cell disease, we have a sickle cell supervisor at each level of health care. And it would be like at the village, the Anganwadi or the Asha workers are the one who are the health, work, health workers trained from the community. They are the health workers from the community, so they know the problem, the language, and how to accept them. And they will be mainly uh, doing counseling, awareness, and health camps. And it would be in the primary health care center where will be, uh, there will be distribution of some drugs. So we have laid down a manual, operating manual, what will be available at which level and who will do that. District hospitals, all district hospitals have HPLC machine and they are the one who would give the sickle cell identity card. We all have, the patient should have identity card to get the benefits. The tertiary care medical colleges where we uh, belong to have tertiary uh, medical care like for hip replacements, splenectomy, we have facilities for uh, TCD, uh, prenatal diagnosis, neonatal screening, all this is done at tertiary care medical level. The, I think this is according what is the need of sickle cell patients and very few need um, bone marrow transplant and gene therapy and India is not behind it. Uh, there are uh, around, uh, as I know, 400 bone marrow transplants have been done till today for sickle cell patients. However, unfortunately, they are mainly patients from Africa and Middle East, not from India. So because these facilities are available in the private sector, not in the public sector, and yes, gene therapy, we are uh, moving ahead, the government of India, and uh, there is a breakthrough in, and I think in the next meeting I may be able to tell what it is. A unique feature which we have is, and it's very cost effective, is the telemedicine. We have telemedicine consultation with the health sub-centers, primary health centers, and we are the one who do consultation continuously from time to time for problems of sickle cell disease in the periphery area. Now these are some uh, examples of innovations we have in India for sickle cell disease because we have to adapt to our uh, site. We cannot extrapolate everything which is done everywhere, which is uh, evidence-based. But then from our uh, necessity, we have uh, innovations. And uh, these are few other innovations. We have guided neonatal screening. We'll do neonatal screening only if the mother is 
uh, screened positive for sickle cell. I know we miss many traits and double heterozygous, but this is best we can do in the limited resources we have. Low fix, I've already told you, the novel way of counseling is color-coded. There is a cocktail given to all patients every six months, which include vitamins, uh, deworming, and calcium. And uh, every, every child is given a uh, spirometer, pulse oximeter, and digital thermometer. Now from bench to policy, this is mainly the patient's uh, support group who have brought this into existence. We have policies by government where all patients of sickle cell receive free, free treatment, whatever it may be. All investigations are free. They have travel concession, monthly incentives, financial to the patients. And we have student-friendly rules like each child with sickle cell may need an extra hour in the examinations, their attendance in the school. And the, I think the most successful was the uh, sickle cell disease included in the Disability Act 2018. There are many facilities like this. Now this is um, communicative, uh, community based care, overcoming social challenges. We have mobile clinic model which is well equipped clinic on the move with doctors and support staff. And they care um, every Wednesday, everywhere in our state, they know that a sickle cell mobile van is going to come to their village. So they are prepared uh, because they don't have to lose their work if they travel to our place. The other unifying care is under one roof, we have a clinic once a week, every Wednesday from 9 to 12, where all multi-speciality, orthopedic surgeon, surgeon, obstetrician, pediatrician, and an adult physician, they all sit under one roof and do this. And I think that it has also helped us for transition from pediatric to a physician, uh, the adult, um, um, when the child goes from pediatric age group to the adult group, and it has been quite smooth with having such um, a clinic in one place. And as I said, telemedicine center we have in our clinic. Uh, so it is not always success. We have many barriers. And we do still see children with uh, like uh, burnt marks, which they had received for pain hot iron, like we still see that, we have illiteracy and that I would say not very limited data we have from our country has marginally moved to older age group. I do agree, but still sepsis, severe anemia with other things are the majority cause of death. In addition, in adulthood, I see many chronic organ damage, mainly in our part of the world, it is the chronic renal failure for which they usually die. So I think the essential steps for improved survival, in addition to the advocacy, community awareness, of course, we are deploying technology to build patient compliance, partially successful, uh, clinician education, we have a white paper on sickle cell disease. But in addition to all this care which we give, I think the basic care we need not forget, the nutrition, the infection, the environmental factors are as important as the other interventions which we are providing. We, we, need, we tend to forget those things. I think they are equally important and uh, the care we provide should be accessible and acceptable. We have to remember those two things. It should be targeted. Like in my place, we have strokes. We should have TC. We have TCD facility and uh, we put them on chronic transfusion, hydroxyurea. We do screen for microalbuminuria, which is, um, I think, rate of renal failure very high. And third, we want a cure that is easily adopted and adapted to my place, my center. And of course, we have been talking about cross collaboration with global centers of excellence. And I think that we have to share the best practices and uh, we have to learn a lot from each other. Uh, and whatever lessons I have learned, I need to share with others and I need to go to other places and learn. And I think the first case of sickle cell disease in India was uh, reported in 1952. 
And now in 2019, much has been done on sickle cell disease, but it has been at an individual institute level. Much of networking within India, outside India is lacking. However, recently the government of India has come up with a national health policy and we have a national hemoglobinopathy program which includes sickle cell disease of course. And probably by the next meeting I may be able to share what we get from that national health program. I'm very hopeful and I hope for a healthier, happy and less affected sickle cell patients. Thank you for patient care. As we go along, there are some commonalities that we see from era to era, but some of the differences are really fascinating. I'm now going to ask Jacques Elion to come and speak to us about the situation in Europe. Well, uh, thank you for the organizers, Willie and Jennifer, for inviting me to uh, this uh, wonderful meeting. I had been to uh, one in London, to several in London, actually. Uh, and, and also it is my, uh, my second time here in, in Jamaica and I'm very uh, glad to be here again. So I will tell you about the uh, situation in, in Europe. And uh, the first thing I, I would like to do is uh, put uh, Europe to scale. Uh, we, we, we've heard about uh, 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 the, the US, we've heard about India. Uh, and we have heard about Africa. So Europe is a continent with 50 countries, a population of 750 million, uh, compared to uh, 320 million in, in the US and uh, uh, 3.5 billion in, uh, in, uh, in India and uh, 1.2 billion in, uh, in, in Africa. So actually, uh, I will uh, concentrate on uh, the European Union, which is uh, just a part of uh, the, uh, the continent. The European Union is composed of uh, 28 countries, 27 at the end of this month. <laughs> <laughs> and the population of is uh, 500 million. The frequency of, of the fiscal cell trait is not very well known. Those are all the data collected by uh, uh, Bernadette Model, but you can see that the uh, frequency uh, were quite low. And also what I would mention is that European Union is, uh, also, has also uh, what is called, uh, uh, amazingly, the uh, outermost regions of uh, Europe. And uh, we, we've heard about, uh, about the uh, Caribbean uh, islands of Guadeloupe and Martinique and, and of uh, French Guiana, uh, which are very much concerned with uh, sickle cell disease. There are also the uh, islands of uh, Azores, Madeira, and the uh, Canary Islands, which are less concerned, and two other uh, French territories in the Indian Ocean, the uh, uh, island of Reunion and uh, Mayotte, uh, who are very close to Africa and also who are concerned uh, with sickle cells also less than the uh, Caribbean uh, uh, outermost regions of Africa, of, of Europe. So, uh, actually in Europe, and I, I think it is quite a peculiarity, uh, uh, sickle cell disease is both endogenous, because you have patients uh, who are really belonging to the uh, uh, population, uh, European population of Greece, Southern Italy, for instance, in, in, in Sicily in particular, Portugal. And, uh, but also you have exogenous population originating from Africa, the Caribbean islands, the Middle East and the uh, Arabic Peninsula, and also the Indian uh, uh, subcontinent. And uh, here I uh, show you this picture, this uh, two uh, cute uh, black children I took from, uh, from the internet. But th these two children here, uh, uh, the, the, the picture I show with the permission of the parents of these two uh, uh, patients because these two boys, one is a carrier, the other one is uh, an SS patient 
And as you can see, they have uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, and they are actually are from Sicily. So they, they got the blonde hairs from the uh, uh, Norwegian, uh, the, the Vikings, and uh, very unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and uh, and uh, very unfortunately, the uh, beta S gene from, uh, from uh, the migration from uh, uh, Sub Saharan Africa. So in Europe, sickle cell disease clearly is not only uh, a disease of, of black uh, population. Uh, there is a long history of uh, migration, uh, mostly from the uh, African uh, continent, but also from the uh, Caribbean and uh, from French Guiana in Europe, mostly uh, to France, uh, the UK and uh, Belgium, the old uh, colonial uh, countries, uh, and, uh, but also to Portugal. Uh, so, uh, if, you, if you see the, the trends of uh, increasing population at risk for sickle cell disease from uh, 1988 to uh, 2006, so in uh, about uh, 20 years, you see that the, the population has uh, dramatically increased, maybe for more than 50%, uh, 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 particularly in, uh, in, in the UK and uh, in Belgium. Also in the Netherlands, which is uh, rather new, and in, in France as well. But uh, now everything is changing because of the uh, contemporary mi migrant crisis that you've all heard about. And there is a dramatic change of migration pattern from the uh, Middle East and Africa. And uh, it is estimated that between uh, 2010 and, 2000 and 2017, Nearly one million asylum claims uh, uh, have been uh, uh, proposed to an European country from people coming from uh, uh, sub Africa, sub Saharan Africa. So, so uh, the, these people are coming from, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the Syria, Afghanistan, uh, uh, and so on, but also from uh, from, uh, from Africa. And the most uh, impacted countries in, uh, in in Europe are Germany here. And, uh, and also Italy and uh, Hungary, but mostly from people from the, uh, from the Middle East. Um, so this crisis has generated, and, and this overall situation has generated the high contrast between countries with past history of migration, like uh, France and the UK, in which sophisticated systems of care and prevention have been developed, and countries with low incidence rate now facing a re recent and rapid changing migrant flow where patients are often underdiagnosed and follow a path insufficiently uh, defined. Uh, so if we, if we take the example of uh, the, uh, the, the two countries that, uh, where the, most of the patients are uh, living right now, uh, namely uh, the UK and, and France, this is the, the two countries in uh, the European Union with the, the highest absolute number of patients. It's about 20,000 patients in each of these countries. Yeah, uh, sickle cell disease has become the most frequent genetic disease in these countries. Uh, both countries have a national uh, newborn screening program. We'll come back to that later. And the incidence varies from one newborn uh, over 2,000 to 1 to uh, 1,800. But uh, the uh, incidence is uh, higher in uh, large uh, megapolis. For instance, in, in, in Paris, one newborn out of 800 is affected with uh, sickle cell disease. So newborn screening in Europe, the history of newborn screening uh, for sickle cell disease in Europe, Europe goes back to almost to uh, 40 years. Still, the situation is highly heterogeneous from one country to another. France and the UK were the first to introduce sickle cell screening in the 80s and to extend the coverage of the, uh, to the entire national territory in the uh, 20s, to 2000s. Netherlands, Spain, and Malta also now have uh, national programs. Belgium screens in the regions of Brussels and Liège, and Ireland has been uh, running a pilot uh, uh, program for many years. Italy and Germany have completed several pilot studies, but are still in the preparatory phase of uh, national newborn screening program. Uh, 
the methods, it's uh, in, in all the, uh, the countries, it's uh, Hilpic uh, dried blood dot. Uh, uh, technically, uh, one uses a two-tier approach with, with uh, HPLC, which has uh, basically replaced uh, isoelectric focusing, but it is interesting to see that uh, mass spectrometry, either tandem mass spectrometry, MSMS in uh, the UK, and uh, MALDI uh, MS in uh, uh, France are uh, more and more used. The advantage of, of these techniques, for instance, uh, in, uh, in my lab in, uh, in Paris, which is one of the three labs involved in, uh, mal in uh, sickle cell uh, screening, we uh, uh, test uh, 180,000 uh, newborns a year with uh, one machine and one technician. So all the uh, programs in Europe propose a universal screening offered to all newborns, irrespective of uh, family origin, but here France is an exception, as often, and <laughs> this exception is that in continental France there is a targeted approach uh, used in which testing is uh, restricted to babies whose parental family origins are from so-called at-risk ethnic groups, and, uh, but in, in the uh, French overseas regions, of course, uh, uh, testing is uh, universal. So this is a, a political uh, uh, choice, you know, and uh, uh, doctors and patients' organizations are fighting to have uh, universal uh, screening in France, which will probably happen in the, uh, the next, next year, at least for two, uh, two main regions. So I will uh, show you this because it's very illustrative. It is the percentage of the uh, newborn ch that who are tested, who were tested in 2006 in the different parts of, uh, of, of France. And uh, you see that uh, uh, only three regions here, uh, uh, the percentage is above 20%. And the majority of the uh, uh, tests are, are, are and, and the patients and the populations are at risk are, are present in the uh, Parisian area, where in uh, 2006, 53 percent of the uh, uh, newborns were tested. But you can see it's uh, highly variable. For instance, uh, in uh, my uh, Auvergne region, here only uh, three percent were tested at the time. Now, what is the situation in uh, uh, 2017? You, you see the, the number of, uh, of green region, if I may say so, has uh, dramatically increased. And in the uh, Parisian area, about 70% of the uh, newborns are considered as uh, being uh, born from population at risk uh, for sickle cell disease. Uh, so, if we look also at the incidence, uh, of, meaning the, the, the number of uh, newborns that uh, have been uh, identified yearly between uh, 2006 and 2017, uh, now there is a, a, about 100 new uh, cases per year, and this uh, number has increased uh, by uh, 24%. Uh, in England, the situation is uh, roughly the same. I mean, the, uh, the patients are concentrated in the uh, uh, big me megapolises, London, Bir Birmingham, and, uh, and Manchester. So, the uh, UK and France have developed very sophisticated systems of care and prevention. I will describe uh, shortly the uh, rapidly the system in, in, in France. It's a national uh, uh, program which is included in uh, the, net, the national program for rare diseases or rare diseases. So in the case of the uh, of sickle cell disease, there is a very dense uh, uh, network of, of uh, 13 uh, sickle cell uh, reference centers and 46 competence uh, centers supervised by two coordinating centers and this is called the uh, filière de santé et de soins, following the patients from birth to, uh, to, to death. So, so that's really a very dense network for a country with uh, only 60 million uh, people. 
there is a very strong connection uh, with the uh, general practitioners and also with the patient associations and also uh, with uh, clinical and basic research, in particular with the laboratory of excellence on, on the red cell. But the situation is the same in, uh, in England where the uh, uh, health system is very much connected to, uh, to research, uh, in particular uh, King's College that <laughs> really knows very well. So, so, so in the UK, the, the, the system is, is very uh, similar, but uh, maybe uh, less uh, structured. Uh, there is a specificity which is uh, uh, the, the linked antenatal and neonatal hemoglobin of hepatitis screening program, which is a, uh, an interesting uh, experience. In the two countries, there is uh, free access to care. In French, uh, the uh, social security system, and uh, in uh, the UK, the uh, national health uh, service. So now the uh, uh, European Union has launched an initiative for implementation of uh, European, uh, European uh, reference networks and for rare diseases and the uh, Eurobloodnet has permission for mission to coordinate and uh, uniformize comprehensive care uh, for hematological diseases including uh, sickle cell disease and uh, one of uh, the first uh, work was to uh, edit recommendation for, for uh, sickle cell screening. For further information, you can find here some of the publications that are open access. And uh, finally, I would like to, to say that uh, uh, we have uh, published a uh, uh, special issue of the International Journal of uh, Neonatal Screening uh, on uh, newborn screening for sickle cell disease in uh, um, most of the, uh, the part of, of the world. And uh, this book can be uh, bought, but it's also on open access on, on the internet. Thank you very much. Um, finally for this session, but by no means least, I'm going to invite Fernando Costa to come and tell us about what is happening in Brazil. And of course, we have a very special link with Brazil because they actually donated our HPLC machine for newborn screening. So we're very happy to have them here. for inviting me to come here. It's a pleasure to be here. And what I'm going to try to show to you briefly some aspects of sickle cell disease in Brazil. So uh, I saw that I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to skip some. But I'm going to try to show you some aspects that I, I think this is important. Uh, the first thing is, As you know, Brazil is a large, it's almost a continent, it's a, the largest country in South America, and our estimated population is about 200 million nowadays. Um, almost all the indigenous population of Brazil are extinct today. We have less than 0.4% of our indigenous population. But it's in, interesting to mention that Several studies um, well, several studies try to find hemoglobin S in the indigenous Brazilian population and none is found. So there is no hemoglobin S in Brazilian indigenous population. Uh, the origins of the Brazilian population is very heterogeneous, as you can see here. The Portuguese were the first to settle in the country. We have a huge forced immigration from Africa. More than four million slaves come from Brazil, 
to Brazil, but also we have Italians, Spanish, Germans, Lebanese, Japanese, everyone. I think I'm doing some, something wrong here. Where should I? Oh, in this line? Okay. okay, I'm just going to show you. Uh, in Brazil, sickle cell disease is dead for a long time. This is a publication from um, 1947, published in the state of Bahia by a Brazilian physician called Gisea Ascioli. And it was published in Portuguese, unfortunately, but described quite accurately quite precisely, the genetic, the genetic transmission was sickle cell disease. It was just a little bit of history. Um, the frequencies of hemoglobin S heterozygotes in Brazil is very heterogeneous. In the north and the south, in the south, the distribution is very different, as you can see here. Um, we have this data for a long time ago. Almost 8% of African Brazilians are heterozygotes. 1% in the general population in the south, east region, and about 7% in the northeast region of the country. Okay, uh, how many patients there is in Brazil with sickle cell disease? We don't know exactly, but it is around 50,000. That's the number that the Ministry of Health estimated. It should be more or less true. The newborn screening in Brazil was started in 2001 as a universal program and it was funded by the Ministry of Health. Some states started before they did that. I would say that the coverage is very heterogeneous. In the south and southeast, south and southeast is higher than in the north and northeast Brazil. If you look at the different states, the results are very different also. I would like to show you, if you look at the Bahia state, you have one patient with, it is important, with sickle cell disease from 600 births. And if you look in the south, the state of Rio Grande do Sul, for example, one patient from 10,000 births. This is, is due to the ethnic difference in our population. This is, I'm going to skip all the data about screening, but you can uh, look. I, I would like to show you some published, da published data that was de derived from the national screening program. The most organized state in Brazil regarding screening is the state of Minas Gerais. Because the program is funded by the central government, but each state has autonomy to do the way that is possible. So this is published in 2015, and you, you can see here that based in, in more than 3 million and 600 newborns, 2,576 children with sickle cell disease. The mortality rate was 7.4, very high, and the major cause was infection, as they described in the state of Minas Gerais. In the state of Rio de Janeiro, a similar study based on sequence, uh, neonatal screening 
based on well, 900 patients, the mortality rate was 4%, and the major causes described was acute chest syndrome and sepsis. Um, another very interesting study published with data based in the screening, the newborn screening program, was very recently published and showed that in 400 newborns with hemoglobin SC disease, the, the co-inheritance of alpha thalassemia reduced very significantly the risk of splenic sequestration. You can see in this figure here. It's very impressive, you see. It's, um, nowadays, all 26 states of Brazil has screening programs. The coverage is heterogeneous. The follow-up is a little bit heterogeneous, but seems to be improving. I'm going to skip the early studies and just to mention what we know about uh, the old style beta S haplotypes, haplotypes in Brazil. The predominance, absolute predominance, is the Bantu haplotype, with only one exception. In the state of Bahia, there is almost a semi proportion of Benin and Bantu haplotype. There is data showing this. It's interesting to, to, to see these results because it shows that the population of sickle cell disease patients in Brazil is different from the US, for example, where Benin haplotypes predominate. Well, um, this is just to show you that in Bahia, the number of Benin and Bantu are almost the same, or even there is a predominance of Benin. And this is a, in according with the Portuguese slave trade, because most of um, enforced immigration from Portuguese trade came to Brazil from Mozambique and Angola. But in Bahia, they came from the Bay of Benin. So this is according to history. Um, alpha Tau in Brazil is between 20% of all, all patients. Um, and this is another data that I would like to emphasize and to show to you. Uh, the genetic The genetic composition of the Brazilian patients are very different from the US, for example, because we have the opportunity to compare this data. In Brazil, the population, all these different populations, are in constant process of admixture. And if you look at the Brazilian patients with, with sickle cell disease, there is a high European background. As you can see here, help. Um, I can't see from here, but I have to come here and show you. If you look here, here is Sico Brazil. Red is European component. Here is Brazilian. You see, the sickle cell disease patient and the general population of Brazil is almost the same. And here 
is SQL US. US is a sample from Philadelphia, but you can see that the percentage of European components is very small compared with the Brazilian. And this is just came out in the scientific reports. It was done by Monica Bell in my lab. So. Um, how we treat patients with sickle cell disease in Brazil? Well, as you know, we have this the public health care system called SUS. Is a universal health care free for all population. And it covers all the costs of patients. It, it is not centralized because each state can do something different, but the money comes from the central government. So what we have done is special centers, in generally in public institutions, universities, but not only all, some public hospitals, and they are called hemocentros in Brazil. We take care of sickle cell disease, but they care of all other uh, diseases of blood, in, including malignancies. In each state, at least one of the centers is in charge of diagnostic procedures, a taking care of the patients, and providing all the medicine that is necessary. Well, we can find these hemocentros that, as we call, all over Brazil, at least one in each state. But the state of Sao Paulo, for example, my state, we have more than six. The city of Sao Paulo, two. My city, Campinas, one. Ribeirão, and so on. Bahia, Pernambuco, even Amazon. Every state has one center. They have to take care of sickle cell disease patients, adults and children, but it, it may be different in each state. For example, my center just take care of adults and the hospital, university hospital, take care of the children. It's, but most of the hemocentros take care of adults and children. They, are, they have to provide free clinical care, all supported by SUS, blood transfusion, penicillin, prophylaxis, penicillin, immunization, and hydroxyurea, and everything else that is necessary. is provided free of cost for all patients. The percentage of patients taking hydroxyurea is different. I ask my colleagues, in my uh, center, for example, we take care of only adults, more than 90% of patients are taking hydroxyurea. But in Pernambuco, where the adults and children is 50%. In the Amazon, 61. In Rio is 40%. The, uh, we think that the number of patients taking hydroxyurea is increasing very rapidly. I would like to show just this 
published study who was carry, carried out by Clarice Lobo from, from Rio, where she was able to suggest that the children taking hydroxyurea in black here has a survival probability higher than children without hydroxyurea. So I'm not going to show everything, but I would like to mention an important study done in Sao Paulo, in the most center of Sao Paulo, where they studied pulmonary hypertension and were able to show that there were 40% of elevated TRV, but when they did catheterization, only 10% was confirmed by pulmonary hypertension. So we have to be careful with doing this kind of diagnosis. And finally, the mortality rate of the patient in Rio is 20 times more than the general population. This, this data was published just in 2018, uh, 2018. And regarding bone marrow transplantation, we have one center with very good experience which is Ribeirão Preto. They have done more than 50 transplants already. And there is data that show that at least 16% 16, 16 of the children, 26% of the adults present at least one indication for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in our population. And for the future, we depend very much of the budget of the Brazilian health system, which is going down every year nowadays. And it's going to be very difficult to implement the expensive new drugs that is coming for treatment. And it's going to be very difficult to implement gene therapy. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of this session, and I hope you'll agree with me that it really gave us a flavor of sickle cell disease right around the world. Join me in just um, applauding all our speakers again. <laughs> <laughs>